Welcome to Cookies, the world's most influential basketball podcast. I am Ben Dietrich. Jordan Ridelli is on vacation. And Andrew Quo, as you might have heard, he doesn't take days off. Andrew Quo, what is new? The weekends, have you heard? Thursdays are the new Fridays. So I'm officially <laughs> partying. How was your hump day? Amazing, incredible. I got over that hump. It, I saw the day and I got over it, man. I'm so excited for tomorrow because, like, TGIF. What? Uh, what frozen cocktail are you gonna indulge in? Oh man, like a I might I might dabble with a little mezcal margarita. Yeah, I know. I Delicious. Know. It's Delicious. It, it's, it's, it's this new mezcal concoction <laughs> that is sweeping the nation. You might have heard about it. It's Mexican. Mm. It's very smoky. It's called mezcal. Nice. You should try it. I should try it. Mezcal I'll, Negroni. I might make myself a martini too. Mm, more martinis. Just two more martinis. Um, if your audio is a little off today, it's because your microphone is not perfect, is it? We've, we've checked my microphone. It is not my microphone. Something is amiss in, the, in Cookies Nation. But the reason uh, I'm bringing this up is not to call anyone out. It's not to it's not to pass blame. It's that, so our gentle readers aren't coerced into saying something about it. And then we have to respond. So we're just telling you right now might not sound as pristine as normal today, but it will get solved. Maybe you didn't even notice, but I just don't want to hear your mouth is what I'm saying. <laughs> we don't want to hear the clickety clack of your your uh, displeasure. Anyway, whatever. This is what happens when you we pot do our every best. day. We do you know, our you, best, man. You burn equipment out left and right. You just run right through it. You know, the equipment's smoking by the time these takes are done on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah, right. So I have some big news for you. Huge. You know, I know you felt personally guilty for a coronavirus being, mm. you know, an, an Asian man. Mm. Great news. Looks like it mostly came from Europe. This is a lot. <laughs> this, this is a real weight off your shoulders. Oh, wow. Wow. So apparently they were able to go in and, you know, analyzing the coronavirus. And it, it doesn't, it mutates as it goes through a population. It doesn't necessarily make it a different virus, but it picks up um, different genetic coding as it, you know, among like 30,000 little indicators or something. That's my, that's my <laughs> layman's description of, of this phenomenon or something should just be attached to my like i should get that tattooed on my forehead mm, or something uh, or something so anyhow the, the revelation here is that among the coronavirus molecules morsels whatever you want to call them the little iotas that came to new york city the vast majority came from europe and specifically london hmm including what they are thinking was the first one to come here. It was from London. And, and, you know, it came from various places, but also like France and other spots. And there were some from Asia. But the idea of Asians bringing it here to New York City, not true. So you are off the hook, my guy. <laughs> so just to be clear, I, I, I'm clearly off the hook. But just to be clear. Um, so you, and that... Master, you and Master P both are <laughs> off the hook. I'm a no limit soldier, Ben. I know, I know. Um, so it, the virus itself still originated from somewhere near Wuhan, but what entered America was not specifically from Asian origin. It, well, it was a medley. Oh. Uh, a, a goulash or a, a jambalaya of mm, coronavirus. A, a remix. But most of it, the lion's share was from of European origins and not Chinese mm -hmm. origins. So you're free to, uh, you know, walk around being Asian now. Like, no harm will come to you. Um, um, we, we now know who the culprits are. It's those damn Europeans. Great. So the ire is, is going to switch from people who look like me to people who look like uh, Americans. 
that yeah, that'll like, work. Like, like I'm now worried about leaving the house. <laughs> <laughs> Is right. that a European? <laughs> Listen, hmm, somehow I'm, I don't know that it'll work like this. I'm European, but I am wear a T-shirt that says I'm European, but I'm not French, Italian, or British. <laughs> Look, I'm European, but did not bring the coronavirus shirt. Is causing more questions than it's answering, <laughs> or something. So I mean, look. I'm sure that the media will jump all over this, and yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> And, Trump. you know, guys named Jacques will be accosted in the streets. Listen, Trump is going to have to go out of his way and say French Americans are great Americans and they're very successful. They do a great job. European Americans are working with us. Yeah, yeah. They are not our enemies. <laughs> they're great Americans, these, these Italians, <laughs> these northern Italians. The British that was the only place that people were still allowed to come from. Everything <laughs> right. else is shut down except the Brexit dudes who are like funneling coronavirus onto our shores like King George ordered it himself. <laughs> you look it, at them, they're little, little red coats. Wow, well, the coronavirus itself is a shade of red. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Go on, I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Yes, yes. I'm just thinking of of all like the British things that now we have to change the names of, like Freedom Bulldogs. Oh, um, like Freedom, the, Freedom, Freedom Knights. That amazing television show, The Workplace. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so funny. Jim and Pam, will they ever figure it out? Stay I, tuned to the American show, The Workplace. <laughs> The cubicle. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, the Zoom chat room. <laughs> are you an advocate of the open workspace, or are you believing that coronavirus will take us back to the days of the cubicle and the corner office? <laughs> uh, ben, I have a business plan for you. Hear me out. <laughs> it's called We Work 2. <laughs> working, uh, working 2, which is I'm going to create little rooms that you can rent out and I'm just going to be a regular landlord now moving forward. Um, and instead of an open floor environment where everyone can intermingle, we're all separate with doors that lock. What do you think? I'm into it. <laughs> what about everyone just kind of gets a bathroom stall and you just slide things beneath them and you get a toilet like you get the whole thing. It's just bathrooms, lines and lines of bathrooms. That's the new American workplace. Well, now that everyone's standing while they work. Maybe they can even be smaller than, they can be like urinals, but with doors. There's also um, these chairs, and I have not worked in a traditional office for a long time, but I know there are chairs that are, I guess they're supposed to help your posture or whatever, but you kind of like wrap your legs around them and you're almost like kneeling. They're kind of like a rocking horse of sorts. I've seen those. Is, aren't those an 80s thing? Isn't this an no. 80s design thing? It could be. I know that they're like popular in a lot of these open office situations, weird sort of rocking chair, kneeling desks. I don't know. Have you or seen standing this, standing desks? Have you seen this infomercial on TV where it's like a reverse necklace where like, you know, how a necklace has something that hangs uh, in front of you under your neck. You something hangs on the, the top of your back, but it it buzzes maybe and it makes your posture better. Do you know what I'm talking about? I do not, but it sounds like something they would sell on TV. Yeah, and it's really tough to tell what this technology does because everyone in the commercial all of a sudden is like, my life is so much better than it was a <laughs> second ago. I'm like, that kind of checks out. You look happier. I would say, going just going back to the office plan, I, when I've been in offices that have the open floor plan, at first, it seems cool. Like, you look around, you're like, wow, everyone's busy as a beaver. They're able to interact. <laughs> and then after a while, you're like, wait, you're just kind of on display at your computer the whole time. And I think it's distracting. And it's also the lack of privacy is odd. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, 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 I do not like them. I think they're, I think they're an excuse to jam a, a shit ton of people into a smaller space. 
Yeah, it's tough for me too to imagine that working. I think it always had to combine with a little bit of the like the Tinder aspect of social interaction. Not only are you signing up for an open space work environment, you should be able to choose your most compatible neighbors. Because if you're next to someone you can't stand, it's a disaster, but it has little to do with the open space. It just has to do with the person maybe eating egg, hard boiled eggs for lunch every day. Uh, you know what I mean? And the thing is, I get how depressing a cubicle is. I have worked in offices with a cubicle, and that is depressing. You're just staring at this little wall that you have in this tiny little space, and you throw up whatever, like photos of your beloved family and Dilbert cartoons. Mm-hmm. And you, like it, it's, it is really, really grim as well. I think the solution here is that everyone should just stop working. And, and we're seeing that today. <laughs> we're seeing people deciding 10% of the population that maybe work's just not for them. <laughs> maybe I'm going to tell the government that the work is not for me and try to get unemployment, which the numbers are wild, man. Dude, it is a trend. Yeah. 16 million people have decided to opt out of the employment, the whole jobs thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, dark days, dark days for the cubicle. Yeah, one of my friends has an office, a small office where she works, and she's been getting, like, not serious, but mild complaints from her coworkers. And I'm like, oh, this this person's pretty reasonable and nice, and she has her own office. I don't quite understand. And we got to talking, and later on in the conversation, it was revealed that for lunch every day, she eats kimchi and hard-boiled eggs, which is very healthy, very good for your gut, uh, has those microbes that you need that are underrated, but also not workplace friendly at all. Not the most workplace friendly. Here's a question. Would you rather be next to a kimchi and hard boiled egg enthusiast Mm -hmm. on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. A bro or kimchi hard boiled egg bro Mm -hmm. or a, a pizza bully? A pizza sidler. Okay, someone explain. Who, explain the someone pizza Someone who he knows that you're ordering pizza. Ah. And then comes over and just slides you a couple ones for the slices they want. A pizza so, bully. Not our hero, the pizza bully. The no, 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 not bully. that king. He's a, he's a sire. He's royalty. So, of course, I would want to sit next to the throne, you know, by proxy, just trying to get some of that royal vibe off <laughs> of him. Absolutely. For sure. <laughs> but um, I would rather sit next to a hard boiled egg kimchi eater. Hmm. I, well, if you were going to allow yourself to be bullied into being a single slice seller, <laughs> then you've got to go with the kimchi bully. Hey, respect those slice sellers, man. They keep, they keep New York rolling. I miss them. I when's miss the last time so you had, much. When's the last time you had a slice? Uh, th- three weeks ago. Three, four weeks ago? I mean, couldn't you just order a, a pie? Aren't they still being delivered? Like Williamsburg Pizza? Cookies, classic shit. tournament runner-up. I shout, think out, d- shout out to that amazing restaurant that is not far from... It. I'm in their delivery zone, but I have not been doing any delivery or any of that stuff. I just cook at home. I have, don't do delivery anyway because I have a problem with middlemen. Mm. But... Yeah, how come you're not delivering? How come you're not ordering food? Is it a, is it a health concern thing? No, because um, I, I enjoy cooking. I, I, my one, like the one pleasurable social thing I have is going to the grocery store once a week. So, you know, we always stock up and I have enough here to eat. I do crave pizza. I also think like it's not safe for the people delivering, you know, but I want to give them money. So, my struggle is trying to figure out how to patronize something like Williamsburg Pizza and also not risk their employees like running around town and pressing buzzers and waiting for people to maybe wave, you know, run by them. I don't know. Um, but I realize me kind of getting delivery is not any better than me going out there and buying something because we're doing this for the community, Ben, not just for my own safety. Well, I mean... I would say that if you're doing this for safety reasons or, or like the community, I'm sure Williamsburg pizza would want the patronage and I'm sure the person running it would want your money in the tip. 
Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm trying to figure out other ways, and yeah, I'm limited in my. I mean, me buying a pizza for, you know, thirty bucks, tipping them twenty bucks, fifty bucks is nice, but that's not sustainable. And I think we need to think of a bigger picture. Maybe I'll I'll throw them GoFundMe money, like a hundred bucks, you know, and not get pizza. That works but for you. Me. But you want pizza, and they want to give you pizza. Everyone here is on the same page. Yeah, I don't want them to take the risk of coming over here, though. So I'd rather go fund me them the cash, and I'll wait for the pizza when it's safe. Then why don't you pick the pizza up yourself? Because I am not going out there because I'm staying in. <laughs> There's going to be time to buy pizza, but they need the money now, so I'll just give them the money. for Just now. order a pizza. Uh, it's okay if I don't. It's just not an emergency. I don't need, I miss pizza, but not like I need to have pizza. <laughs> I know, but you can get pizza and you can support a local pizzeria and support their staff. It I all get, in one fell swoop. Why don't like re- That why requires don't I, you, like, you don't even have to have any contacts. Why don't I just give them twice the support and they don't have to risk anything? But you don't get pizza in this scenario. That's okay. All right, this is insane. I, 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 it is. It's insane. I admire so much your dedication to not contacting anyone ever, but like not ordering pizza to not endanger their workers. That's a bridge too far, Quill. If you what? want the pizza, you can do it or you can pick it up. Oh, no, I know I can do this, but I, I just think that all of us kind of being the safest we can be and the most generous we can be is probably a good place to be. Look. You are a you are a a quarantine hero. No one no. no one has approached it with a dedication as you. And if we all did, this thing would be wrapped up. I hear no, you. No, no. You are I fighting mean, the good fight. Now you're getting angry. Like, I'm not angry at you. I'm saying you're right. You should do whatever you're comfortable doing. You are correct. I'm not angry with you in the least. I mean, I'm saying I'm only frustrated to hear someone who I know loves pizza <laughs> saying I'm denying myself pizza because I don't want the delivery guy to come here and hand me a pizza. I'm literally saying that. I know uh, that's that's why I'm frustrated. Yeah. I mean, I I kind of don't want to like order anything from Amazon right now because I know they have problems with their delivery and people are getting sick and I don't want to order anything from Fresh Direct because I think like they're probably the workers are at risk and I know I can't go fund everybody, but this is the problem we've been talking about for months, right? Like at some point my money runs out because I don't know anybody at Fresh Direct. And I don't even know if they have a GoFundMe, but I've never used it. But I'm but no one should be no it. one should be giving to a GoFundMe for for Fresh Direct. Yeah, I agree. But you know, I, I love three re- uh, pizza spots near me. Um, that's like three hundred bucks of GoFundMe. That's kind of hard, you know. I'm just saying, order a pizza, man. That's all I'm saying. I'm saying order that. I'll wait. I'll wait. You know, and I've already. Given all the money I can give? I'm not <laughs> saying to give money to them. I'm saying to order a pie. No. I'm not saying uh, give a couple hundred bucks to the Williamsburg Pizza um, GoFundMe, although I'm sure it would be welcomed. <laughs> right. and like yes, it's something we are that, saying that. <laughs> I, no, I'm saying people should do that. I'm also saying <laughs> if, if, if it's a choice between giving nothing at all and then having a nice slice of pepperoni, <laughs> like there's a way to do that. That's all. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I have an annoying take on this but it's just my own take it's like you know you, you wear a mask before they tell you to wear a mask not for your own safety which is probably good too but like so someone else doesn't have to right dude i take no problems i'd not take no problem. i have i have like <laughs> however you feel like is you best for you and in turn is best for society is great i just hate seeing you craving pizza. that's all <laughs> I can't wait to have that slice. We should have it together. We should go to Scars. And what would, what would your, be your order with your Dietrich pizza technology? I mean, oh, right, right. I mean, you know, just go pepperoni sausage. But I mean, I can just go to like That's Poly nice. G's and get a pie right now. I love Poly G's. Um, they make they're, an they're awesome selling, vegan. They're selling pies from the window. It's awesome. I mean, I, I desperately want all these places to stay in business, man. But... Um, Whatever, what I do is what I do. Uh, that's, that's what I'm saying. I'm agreeing. I'm, I can argue with you, but undeniably what you do is what you do. Yeah. Um, I'll have that pizza again. I guarantee it. <laughs> yeah. So another th- a piece of news that I saw um, besides about the 
um, European origins of the Eurovirus, as we're now calling it. <laughs> the Paris virus, the Paris site virus, um, is that people are saying that if, peop- if there's a jogger or a runner or a walker, that you should stay further behind them than the two meters, six foot um, recommendation because they leave a slipstream, as it was described, behind them <laughs> of the Roni. And this kind of tied in a, a debate that I've seen on Twitter that I got into a little myself about the, the hazards of a jogger. And there's a lot of hatred for these joggers because they are obviously panting, they are sweating, they're breathing in and out without a mask on, they are exhaling, and they cover a lot of ground. And there has been a widespread anger towards joggers who are on the sidewalk. How do you feel about joggers on the sidewalk? (laughs) I've never thought about them. Um, I don't have a problem with them at all because there's not many places you can, like, you have that you can jog in New York. You know, like jogging in the bike lane, you get harassed by bicyclists. Uh, I'm okay with joggers on the the sidewalk as long as uh, like I don't like the jogger who's annoying and bumps into people. But that's just the person, not all joggers. Not all joggers. <laughs> look, um, look. Some of my best friends are joggers. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I'm gonna still tell you the hard truth. <laughs> so I've never thought about them before. These um, people. Yeah, and I I see a, a lot of them because I spend a lot of time on Delancey Street. And a lot of people run to the Williamsburg Bridge to go jogging. And even when you're on the Williamsburg Bridge, that's like a track, basically. Um, I don't mind them at all. But during this Roni era, I can see why people are a little persnickety about the proximity of these huffers. I don't know that a jogger carries more of a a risk of infecting you with the Roni than a normal pedestrian. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, they are obviously exhaling more air and they're covering more ground so they could potentially encounter more people than an average individual. And you also can't, like, gauge that the six foot distance with a jogger because they're passing you or they're they're moving around so fast. And they're but they're going and they're yeah, you can't time how you approach an intersection with someone who's running. So I don't know the scientific basis of concern about joggers being coronavirus vectors. I will say, people who jog on relatively crowded sidewalks need to be jailed. <laughs> it's, it's, why would they do that? Why? I don't get it. Like on, We're talking about busy, busy sidewalks and people will jog down it darting around pedestrians. I'm like, stop it, man. I don't play basketball on the sidewalk. I don't wrestle. Oh, I'm just going to go out there and do some calisthenics on the sidewalk. No. Well, what makes you think the sidewalks are for exercising? It's freaking crazy, Quo. Well, there's like two annoyances here, right? Like one, you have sometimes like the peacocker, someone who's like really great at running maybe they look amazing they have the good gear yes. they have the vapor flies they look awesome and they're just like look how sh- in shape i am as i'm scarfing down like a soggy slice of pizza i'm like i'm just a troll and like dig a ditch and put me in it and that feels bad but also it's sort of like i feel like this is a discussion about road rage and even bike messenger rage or bicyclist rage because people can kind of judge you in a split second with a honk or a snide remark or a brush and they're just gone in a second so they're like fuck you and then they're just like disappearing and i find that to be so like infuriating when it comes to like driving if if people had to stop and like open their car doors for a few minutes after they like display an act of aggression there would be no road rage right because there would be retribution of some sort Right, because there's not specifically pedestrian rage. Right. It, I think there is a, an element of right, the frustration of traffic or whatever, but also the availability of an exit. The, yes. the lack of individual responsibility. That if you say, hey, fuck you, and throw someone a, a middle finger, and you did that while you're both like walking on the sidewalk, you do that enough times, you're getting punched in the snout. Yeah. 
there was but that in a car. You're like, fuck off. <laughs> it's like zip yeah. off somewhere. There was that viral meme of some guy spitting in that other guy's face as the subway doors closed. Oh. But he miscalculated because the guy was able to pry them open again. And that was oh. the end of that guy's good day. I did see that, yes. That was, yeah, that was, that we was, talked about it. <laughs> I love some street justice. <laughs> Very 90s rap of you. But, you know, you kind of see it like when runners, like when uh, I've seen runners like slap the hoods of cars that are parked too far close to the light and impeding like walking traffic. And the drivers, I'm just like, calm down, Gen X Tranquility, man. That was the most horrible thing. They're just like, watch where you park, you know, or watch where you stop and slam the hood. And the guy wants to get out of the, or the person wants to get out of the car and say something, but they can't because the runner's now gone. And I'm like, that's a really tough situation to be in. You can't be the better person here because you're the only person here. So that's true. But if someone like blows a red light or does something that endangers me, I, I'm definitely known to like slap the ass of a car. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Like, I'm not saying it's a habit, but if someone like does something like, whoa, you just blew a red light and almost hit me, like you might get your bumper. Your your bumper uh, lightly massaged. I'm not gonna like hurt your car. Yeah. Granted, it would suck if someone got out and like shot me. But <laughs> yeah. like that, would, like that, the joke would really be on me <laughs> right. in that yeah. situation. Yeah. I'm guilty, and I don't love this about myself. I'm guilty of doing the shrug a lot. Like when someone makes a right on red, and we're trying to cross, like pedestrians are trying to cross. Sometimes, if I'll I'll do a shrug at them. Which is like super passive aggressive, but I think that's better than just being aggressive. But it's still lousy. I don't like when I do that. Yeah, I like the shrug. I like the I like a good sort of expletive. Yeah, I like a good f bomb. Yeah, yeah. Fuck you, do what the fuck you're going? Like, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, we we're, we know how this works. Fuck is this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. It's great. <laughs> Balls. <laughs> <laughs> Stu guys. <laughs> uh, we shouldn't mock the Italian because that's where the Roni came from. They're really suffering these days from a lot of prejudice, so we don't want to perpetuate that's true. That's like, true. narrative. We don't want to push any stereotypes about, no. the moo- about the moose or the gabagool. Because that they... really burns my cannoli. <laughs> it's a spicy meatball, man. These guys brought Corona to our shores. Oh, first... They stole spaghetti from the Chinese and guns and then brought that delicious spaghetti and those very entertaining, useful. Uh, I don't know how to describe guns. How would you describe guns? I don't know, like manicotti shells full of Corona. Right, like those it's filled with um, little sausage <laughs> plugs, little mini sausages. I'll slug you with these mini, mini wieners. <laughs> I'm about to start... Let's just start cooking up some sausage. Slug you with some mini wieners. <laughs> um, I'm about to start trolling you on pizza again, though. If you're not careful, you keep you you lay off these Italianos. <laughs> you got to support your local Italiano. Look, leave my paisanos off of this. <laughs> uh, what the hell were we just talking about? It was something really exciting? Oh, jogging the joggers. <laughs> so here's my other thing. There's something about the jogger that is very entitled and this idea that I'm allowed to walk out of my house unlike any other adult in New York City and immediately exercise. Like, I don't need to go to a park. I don't need to go to a jogging path. I don't need to go to a gym. I don't need to go on the road. I can just go anywhere I want and exercise. I'm the only person who's allowed to do that like a child. Or, or a wild beast. I'm allowed to exercise as soon as I step out of my apartment. Like, <laughs> you wouldn't jog around Midtown, right? Like, well, no, not enough room. Okay, so you're the judge of whether there's enough room to, <laughs> the to judge jog or not? And jogger. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> I think it's okay in a, in a, a suburban neighborhood like in Brooklyn. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's mm-hmm. leafy and their sidewalks are, are relatively empty, residential. Yeah. Sure, okay. But people, like, were doing what you were saying, peacock jogging down, like, Bedford Avenue or down, mm. like, First Avenue. Like, what are you doing? There's people, like, I, I never worked out in a gym, but I imagine there's people, like, in gyms who are there to not only get into shape 
and get into their self-care mode, but also to peacock a bit, right? Like this is maybe 60% of like gyms, especially Shequinox. Yeah, but that's the right environment for it. It like, is. Like if you're jogging down a busy pedestrian street, you either have to go in the road or go onto a side street. Like there's no reason that you should be believing it is acceptable to be a grown adult exercising on a public pedestrian pathway. It's just, I, it's, an, it's, it's a wild amount of privilege. I'm and a you should check that at the door. I'm a reformed uh, street jogger. I jogged every day on the street for maybe 10 years until my knees shot up, uh, like were destroyed by New York City concrete. And I used to jog in good shoes, but maybe I should have changed them more. But um, I used to jog to food. So I would, <laughs> it was awesome. I would, it was, they were very modest jogs, but I would find out where I wanted to eat. And let's say it was like a couple miles away. I'd be like, cool, I'm going to go get that sandwich. And I'd run to the sandwich, get it and walk home with it. I was about to say, dude, you weren't jogging. You were just running to food. <laughs> That's literally what I'm saying. It was a modest interpretation of jogging. But I'd be covered in sweat. When being like, I'll take a number one. And they're like, you're sweating. I'm like, just give me the number one. And then I'd walk home with it. <laughs> it was awesome. I got it's, it's like every someone day. Ring, it's like someone rings a dinner bell and you come running. You're like, I was exercising on the way here. <laughs> oh, it was awesome. So I'd run to like Midtown or Uptown to get food from downtown. <laughs> so it was like, you know, you get on the West Side Highway and go up to like the Chelsea Market. Which is like three miles, right? Dude, you were just in a hurry to eat. <laughs> this is literally what I'm saying, man. That's so good. I'm I like, it. I used to I run to it. food, and you're like, Are, did you just run to food? I'm like, yes, I ran to food. I, yes, no, I get it, but I love it being interpreted as jogging when it's really just <laughs> hustling to food. But that's, that's incredible. I love. You it. know how they say like New Yorkers are more in shape because they don't drive? It's like this tiny shit is shocking, like. It's like, oh, New Yorkers don't really suffer from that much obesity because we can't, we don't have cars. Yeah, I'm like, that's, oh, that's weird. That's all it takes. Like, it's kind of all it takes. No, it's true. It's true. I mean, I think the way that Europe in general, oh. the people who brought us coronavirus <laughs> and, and other hits, but the reason they stay slender is, is totally that as well. They, if you're in urban centers... In Europe, you are generally not driving at all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now that we've really hit places like Japan with our our snack foods and our KFCs and all that good stuff, now now they're getting body positive now too, right? Yeah. And it's also happening in places like South America because the same companies that have been vilified here, like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, for selling you know, garbage food and specifically soda are now focusing a lot of their efforts on places like Brazil. And we're seeing spiking obesity rates because those corporations are, are focusing on like shoveling piles of sugar into the bodies of, of people in other countries now. It's wild. Very, very cool. Um, yeah. If we were like super woke, it'd be like, okay. The Europeans brought over this virus, which is awful, that is decimating us. But we shipped over soda. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. That might be an even trade. <laughs> In our wokest moment. I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I think it's okay if you go there. <laughs> You're depriving yourself of pizza. You are allowed to take whatever liberties you want. I love it. I love it. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to take a two naps today. Yeah, I man, I, again, I just... I, I, I feel as if joggers are finally being attacked. And, and I think it's a great moment for my longstanding anti-jogger agenda. And I'm excited to see so many people turning on joggers. Well, there was that study that was published yesterday that I wasn't even sure was real, but it had nice illustrations to it. It was, I think, from Denmark or Belgium. And it was, it was scientifically like trying to describe the feeling you have, but not with the... Not with the vibes, but it was like, yeah, joggers can spread this disease faster and quicker than um, normal people who are walking on the street because of breathing rate, because of uh, the amount of area they cover in a short period of time. 
and it's just they leave a vapor trail of whatever they're carrying in their lungs on the street. You know where joggers won't be able to hurt you? County jail. <laughs> but the, yeah, I, I think, you know, I was kind of noticing of late, and, and I think it's because maybe there's less pollution in the air from less traffic mm-hmm. and um, less people around, just in general, less sort of like scent triggers, if you will. But like noticing the smell of someone with a cigarette from like across the street and noticing someone way ahead of me making a turn and being able to smell like whatever is cologne or perfume or even like detergent. I, I don't know. I, I You haven't stepped foot out enough <laughs> to necessarily notice not. this. But there is something odd going on right now, at least olfactory wise, where it mm. feels like it feels like I'm picking up smells or maybe I'm just really paying attention to it because I'm sniffing the air for Rona. But I'm picking up smells from really far away. And it's the same way now you just hear ambulances all the time because there's no other ambient noise. So you just hear an ambulance. I don't know. I noticed this like two days ago. And I was like, what the fuck? I'm, I notice I can smell this person's cigarette from like across the street and like 30 yards away. Very weird. Yeah, totally. It's like uh, listening to music or eating with your eyes closed, right? It's like a completely different thing. And stepping out there with Rona on your noggin is a whole different experience. It's definitely part of that is like really being attuned to like other people and noticing them and like picking up on whatever they're doing. Like, are they being reckless? Are they coughing? Are they are they a threat? And I think it is that that higher elevated attention that is making you pick up, say, like a scent or something. It's very strange, though. Yeah, man. Like uh, last week, last time I was out, uh, or two weeks ago, I saw some guy with a mask lift his mask up to haka loogie. Yeah, gross. And I wouldn't really notice that before, maybe. I don't know. My, my pet peeve, uh, similar to your pet peeve with runners, is people who hawk loogies. I just really i am bummed out on that. But uh, Yeah, I saw a dude do it on the street while I was driving. And yeah. I, was like, I was like, what's wrong with you, man? Come on. That's been my thing, like for a long time and I've tried to apolo- apologize for it in that like the cultures are different and certain cultures don't think spinning is bad but I just find it to be gross I'm like these are beautiful streets man like can you just not spit out of like some weird machismo thing like uh, there again attacking Italians I, I apologize wow. I'm sorry Italians known for spitting on the ground machismo uh yeah anyway joggers are bad imprison them and they should be going to like special like tracks or paths for jogging and not jogging on the sidewalk that's can, that's my that's my stance can i give you a hypothetical and see mm-hmm. if this is uh acceptable what if you're tricked out in your uh, jogging gear you got your hokas or your vapor flies you got good breathable socks you got your nick shorts on and you have your running tee that says uh, I'm European, but not British. And they're yes. fu- it's full kitted out, and they're walking towards their jogging destination. Are you okay with that? Well, I, I think there should be special camps. <laughs> oh, no, no. For joggers. No, no camps. <laughs> no or lists, they, no camps. They, I don't know, some sort of emblem that they could wear, a pin or, <laughs> oh, or, no. or, or, or a hat. I, I don't know, you know, just something to identify them so no. we know that they're a jogger and we know that we should be careful around them, that they may be carrying our, an, the Italian disease. No. No, uh, no. no. I, look, if you're just wearing athleisure and you're not actually in the act of jogging, mm. I think it's okay. The one thing that is really a concern, though, is how do you differentiate between a jogger and someone who's just sprinting home to come and get it? <laughs> I thought you meant, how do you differentiate between a jogger and someone who's just hype? <laughs> <laughs> it's tough these days, man, but you can tell. You can tell. Uh, 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 what's up with athleisure these days? Are we, are we cannibalizing athleisure, or is this the golden age? This is the dawn of an even new era Two, athleisure two, more athleisure. So I've been thinking about this a lot. <laughs> Lay it on me, man. Go off king. I, I felt like athleisure peaked about like four years ago. You know, three years ago, it really reached a point of such cultural prominence 
that the center could not hold and that everyone from like cool people to lame people to everyone was wearing, you know, the same sort of like, oh, it's a, it's shorts with spandex underneath it. It's a t-shirt. It's a sweatshirt. And like, you couldn't tell if someone was going out or you couldn't tell if they were coming from the gym or if they were a jogger. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, I felt it couldn't withstand everyone looking the same in that, in that way. So I thought we were going to be on the, the, the path to a, a greater, better country where athleisure would be frowned upon and we would start seeing people dressing more individually and with more style because it, athleisure sucks. Like it's, it sucks. Everyone dressing like they're coming to and from the gym is terrible. It's deeply, deeply uninteresting and generic. So, so when but, I was, oh, but go ahead, go ahead. with coronavirus and now everyone's at home in sweatpants and has to kind of work out on their own. Yeah. I feel like we're now back in peak athleisure. <laughs> well, back when I was wearing Nick shorts socially, um, <laughs> It didn't look like I was coming from the gym, and I want to like pretend like, oh, I just threw this on, whatever. I think about what I want to wear as much as everybody, and I wasn't allowed to wear Nick shorts with sneakers. It just didn't look right, so they had to be wallabies, because <laughs> one step too far, and the whole thing just, the. But you wear some wallabies, and really makes the Nick shorts shine, Ben. Um, mm-hmm, I've heard that. Mm-hmm. I mean, they didn't put pockets in them for me just to ball in them. Of course, they thought I was going to wear them to the club. So my thing is not saying, oh, well, I'm such a stylish icon and that like athleisure is beneath me. It was more that it was discouraging people who are potentially fashionable and do have interesting ways of dressing from exhibiting that that those kind of looks. That was the problem with it, mm. was that... It made everyone look exactly the same. I, yeah, I was very in favor. I am currently very in favor of athleisure. I like the direction of that quite a bit. Um, of course, it gets it gets plain if you see enough of it. But I thought that was. I'd rather see more of that, just because it's affordable. It's comfortable. You know, like. I can't be that mad at it. If you slap a logo on it and double the price, what is it, like 300 bucks now? That's very expensive, actually. But um, I enjoy sweatpants and sweatshirts. And But what we're talking about, okay, can I ask you? Yes. Is this athleisure, like, supreme? Or are we talking athleisure, like, uh, Under Armour, like, new fabrics? Yes, like... I'm, t- I'm, t- I'm not talking about just, like, sweatshirts or sweatpants. I'm talking specifically kind of about, like, joggers <laughs> new technology right like yeah like breathable I, materials and stuff. i mean i thought maybe what let's say eight ten years ago when like rick owens and the sort of health goth and those kind of things were it was like everything kind of looked like baggy black basketball shorts and that was sort of a, a fashion trend was, yeah i'm literally the health goth idea i love it that was interesting and cool and, and fun and then it just went so mainstream after like Yeezy and, and all that kind of shit that everything just now looks like sports gear. So mm. that, that's what I'm complaining about. I'm not saying like sweatshirts are bad. Sweatshirts are great. Cookie sweatshirts are incredible. 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 Oh my God. Woo. I'm saying the specific look of everyone appearing as if they are coming to or from the gym at all times. Like mm-hmm. I'm going to go to the supermarket looking like I'm coming from the gym. One of my, I used to live with a guy who decided to get dressed up to travel. I think we've mm. talked about this, but if he was getting on a plane to visit his parents in Tennessee, he's like, I'm going to wear a suit. I know that's going a little bit far, but I'm tired of looking like a schlub. And I had that experience. I think I was in a, a layover in Europe, I mean, like 10 years ago where the coronavirus originated. And I think I was wearing like a Bart Simpson vintage tee, my Nick shorts and, you know, the wallabies as discussed. Mm -hmm. And I felt shame. I was like, I'm not presenting myself right. This is the the wrong context. So ever since that moment of realization, I've been trying to wear like button downs, clean pants and like clean (laughs) shoes when I travel. I personally 
agree with this in theory. Yes, that, like, this is all in theory. That yeah, you know, it's it's a public forum, mm-hmm. and it's there should be a, an element of refinement in the same way as well. Are you, are you going to a restaurant? Like, would you wear those shorts in a restaurant? Would you, you know, like th- that kind of idea? Like that, mm-hmm. it's just being presentable. It's not oh, you should get dipped <laughs> for the plane. Like, that's not right. what I'm saying. No, not at all. But My uh, point is just yeah. that restaurant quality. Yeah. <laughs> Decent restaurant. Yeah. Not, you know, not an Arby's, but a... Sir, this is a, an Arby's. A, 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 a charbroil, like a higher-end Arby's. Like a sizzler. Like Arby's, except it's not just Arby's. You know, it, it's yeah. like like the good, the good one. Uh, f- yeah. Friendly's? Sizzler is a good example. Scissors, great. But yeah, yeah, that it, it's a reasonable, uh, casual Fridays. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, this is maybe taking it too far, but in that moment, I realized I was not only representing myself, but Americans, New Yorkers, Asian Americans, people <laughs> with glasses, people who like to wear, who like to go on trips. Like it was, it was more than me, Ben. You're more than an athlete. <laughs> Stick to Nick shorts. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking more more than a mathlete. <laughs> oh, I was a mathlete. Have I told you this? And you're more than a mathlete. I'm more. Yeah, I was also a science Olympian. <laughs> I made little little models. Dude, watch the games. <laughs> do you even do you even do the puzzles? <laughs> but I have changed my opinion on the travel thing a bit because airlines treat us with such disrespect. It's humiliating. <laughs> you are herded into these sardine cans, chided for like everything. You're f- served not even gruel, like more gruel. <laughs> I love airline food, but I agree too. They they serve you garbage. They now like charge for everything. Yes. It sucks. It sucks. Oh, sorry, you can't put your luggage in the overhead. It, it just the whole thing sucks. Mm-hmm. So like, if you want to wear. I don't know, Wallabies and Knicks shorts, like go off King. <laughs> like they've lowered the bar for the elegance of traveling to such a degree that I'm like, yeah, wear like a onesie with like bunny socks and a cartoonish wears Waldo sleeping hat. Like do whatever you want, man. <laughs> One of my friends does a lot of traveling and she's in the fashion business and she's always, she always looks amazing, you know? And as soon as she gets on a plane or is about to, immediately she's like, oh, I have my whole thing. And it's like these, it's a whole sweatsuit with like pillows. It's it's Naomi Campbell-esque, but with none of like the germophobia. It's just comfort, maximum comfort. She's like, I got a pillow. I got that thing for my neck. I got a whole set of like matching sweatpants. I don't wear shoes, but I have these like slippers I put on. It's incredible. Yes, I'm, I'm in favor of that. Like put on <laughs> yeah. your velour Sean John and do yeah. your thing. Yeah, on, on flights like longer than two hours, just go off. But I, I still try to dress up in like a, a button down and wear pants that I have not worn to studio yet, you know? My only thing is you just should not dress like you're a Celtics fan. And by that, <laughs> by that I mean no replica jersey without a shirt underneath. <laughs> That's the rule. That's the only rule for traveling. No replica D Brown jersey with exposed arms. If you are forced, if like the the fate of a loved one was in hanging in the balance, what vintage Celtics jersey would you wear if you had your choice? Oh, hmm, vintage. Oh, it could be recent too. Just uh, what Celtic player would you would you stand for? Would you drop kick as a Murphy? Oh, mm. I mean, if it's a current one, I like Marcus Smart. I've always been a Marcus Smart fan. He's great. Respect to Marcus Smart. That's if a it was a one. if it was a vintage one, mm-hmm. um, I would either go with Len Bias or Reggie Lewis. Like you know, you can't dislike those guys because they died. Did Len Bias ever get to hold up like a press conference with Celtics jersey? No, I think he went straight to the the um, overdose. That was like a two days later, right? Mm, it was like the same night or two days. Yeah, I don't know, man. Um, that story is probably darker than we'll ever know, but or maybe not as dark, but. Um, yeah, I don't know who I would pick. 
Is Keith Van Horn available? Oh, it'd be Stefan Marbury. Done. Ah, or or Celtics legend Shaquille O'Neal. That's tight, and that is an Irish name, so <laughs> that kind of work checks out. So basketball. Love um, it. there's been a little bit of news. One of the uh, uh, topics of interest to some of our listeners might be that the Bulls' search for a GM has concluded, and they settled on our Turis Karnasovas, who was a sort of the assistant. He was the general manager, but sort of second in command in the front office in Denver. But they interviewed a, a, a favorite of the Cookies pod, Brian Colangelo. Oh, I thought this whole time Arturis Karnasovas was Lithuanian for a, a, a Kalangeli. No? So we're not going to get back into Italian bashing because I know you want to do that. We're not <laughs> doing that right him. now. We're not Let doing that. Him. No, come on. Let but Brian Colangelo apparently interviewed for the Chicago Bulls job. That is, just, that was, is that surprising to you? No, because I think... His father probably, every time there's a GM opening, his father's like, you must interview my son if you catch my drift. And I'm not saying he's like some sort of mafioso. Jesus Christ. He's not Marlon Brando in The Sopranos. You are relentless. Or Roy Donovan. He's not Bunchy from the hit show Roy Donovan. But he may have some pull here and there in the NBA because he's such an influential name. Uh, and he, I think there could be a situation where it's like, not only do we want someone with Jerry Colangelo's backing, but we're forced to kind of give him a shot. With no evidence to support that, I assume. None. I have zero, zero. Except that Brian Colangelo was interviewed, which was, I think, uh, a little surprising, but not surprising. It's worth mentioning that Jerry Reinsdorf is one of the most longest tenured owners in the NBA. And Jerry Colangelo was an owner at the same time as, as Jerry. They have known each other for a really long time. I know back in the 90s when there was talk of, I believe, bringing, I forget what kind of sports franchise, like a baseball franchise pre-Diamondbacks to Arizona like Reinsdorf came and like advised Jerry Colangelo, mm. you know, old, old school, old school buddies. So it does not surprise me that he would say, Hey, you mind like, you know, talking to my son. I mean, like, like they're literally yeah. old friends. They know each other. And uh, yeah, I, I did not find it shocking other than like, it was sort of like, why would you, actually do that if you're the bulls other than doing i guess it's just i guess it's just a solid yeah i believe so and the process went quick and we had this karnasovas news kind of immediately after we found out who they were interviewing so it went down pretty fast and we kind of talked about the same thing uh last week when we talked about how you know brian colangelo was mentioned as interviewing for the brooklyn job right before the sixers popped him into position and it Felt like that could have been the same thing. Jerry said, hey, can you like, you know, can you like, quote unquote, interview my son? When you is know? he going to when is he going to ratchet it up and be like, if you want me to not give <laughs> you a hard time, you will hire my son. Well, that's what they did in Philly, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was a test. And you passed. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what happened. But, I, you know, I don't even want to talk about like the impact of say a burner scandal Mm. i just think it's quite odd that anyone would actually consider him based on his record in philly like that to me is let's leave aside the entire burner scandal even just uh, based on his track record in philly the guy is not someone you would interview for a, a general manager job right now i'm always curious what the criteria for these jobs is because if we look at people's track records, like a lot of it's based on luck, like what draft pick you had. Like I drafted John Wall. I'm like, of course you did. <laughs> yeah, anyone would have drafted him if you got the number one. Um, and like, 
what is the criteria? You being uh, trusted and having an open line to your colleagues in order to facilitate trades and deals, having a good relationships with other GMs, maybe that's the Elton brand angle. Um, I think that's more valuable than I assume. But if you look at the track records of all of these GMs, I'm like, this is not necessarily impressive. You drafted Tim Duncan, but it is impressive because you won a bunch of championships, you know? Well, what was, uh, I forget his name, I'm just spacing, but the, the, who, the former GM with the Milwaukee Bucks was hired, um, I, I, John Hammonds, I think his name is, was hired by Orlando to run mm-hmm. the franchise. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it was based off of acquiring Giannis and Middleton. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they were not, they're a small market, and he was able to find a couple of stars, one of them who's incredibly boring. And that was like the feather in his cap. He's the guy. Don't who, say that about Giannis, man. He's <laughs> exciting. He's the guy who found Giannis and Middleton, and that's his deal. And he was hired off the strength of that. And then you can see in Orlando, you're like, I don't know if he's done a great job. He drafted Mo Bamba, who like I personally thought was a cool prospect, but has still not, has potential. But has not been great. Um, I don't think you can look at really any of their moves and say the uh, oh, Orlando was crushing it here. No, nope. but but they're an okay team. They're like the Fultz deal, I don't know if that's a good trade. I don't. I mean, we don't, I don't know yet. I love that trade for them, but we don't know. Same, same. But it's kind of we're saying it's results are mm-hmm. are, are how will dis- determine whether you did a good job as a GM or not. Yeah. It's like did that guy you picked with the nineteenth pick turn out to be surprisingly a superstar? Yeah. When you traded for Fultz, did it work out or not? Oh, he ended up being kind of like a backup point guard that we're now paying $10 million a year. Yeah. Eh, doesn't, doesn't make a difference. And it's like the strength, It's yeah, like you said perfectly, it's like the results of drafting Nikola Jokic so late. Uh, getting a point guard that late in the draft who is an all-star is just incredible. And, he, you know, Karnasovic is also attributed to drafting Jamal Murray, who ends up being a nice player. Uh, he also paid him Ben Simmons money. And uh, Nurkic he drafted, which was kind of a hit too. And, and these are all wins for him. But maybe I would love to be a fly in the room because maybe Karnasovic is like, well, I have, I have a point of view that led me to this place. Let me describe how I think. And I, I just wish I could hear all that stuff. I also don't know who did what in that front office because totally. he are you are you itching? Oh, uh, I'm I'm are you scratch. Yo, I'm actually doing the Monte Ellis thing right now, which is so weird. You know, in front of the computer, like with my hands, like this. You, as you can see, you as you can a, see, was that a Birdman hand rub I heard? I'm I'm basically doing exactly that. Um, but yeah, I don't know who did what in that front office because. They've clearly done a good job in terms of assembling late round talent, having some lottery picks, putting together a, a, an excellent team without being able to sign a superstar. And if you are a smaller market team and you look at that success, you say, this looks great. And if you're a team like the Bulls, you say, well, imagine if you could take this kind of productivity, but put it in a big market. You know, we're mm-hmm. Chicago. And, you know, sneaker companies will pay people an extra couple million dollars a year to play here. So if you can take that sort of small market mentality to rebuild our, our, our franchise and then turn us into a winner in Chicago, like that's a that's a lot of upside. And that's kind of different from the Knicks model, which is saying <laughs> we're we're a big dog right now. We need a guy who can like bring in the, the stars and like New York City and L.A. went that method, too. This is kind of like the Brooklyn way. It's saying let's go with a a team that can, you know, someone who can identify smaller talents and build out a roster and draft cagely, you know, the way that uh, Denver seemed to do. They hit on the guys later in the draft. They found guys like, you know, Will Barton, who was sort of cast aside. And they they did a good job assembling a a deep team. You know, those guys like Torrey Craig and... I like they, the they, their front office. Have. Their front yeah. office has done, a, I would say, a very good job. I don't know specifically what their identifiable outlook is, but they have a knack for acquiring talent. I mean, they have a, they had and have a chance at a ring this year. They're that good. I think they're 
in the top five in the NBA. Um, and I love, I love the way the Bulls did this, to your point. Uh, he is someone who has been, who has displayed a kind of long but maybe, Long right? View. Maybe. Yes. Okay. Yeah. What I'm saying is not the Knicks' view <laughs> or not the Lakers' view, right? Like this hire, I think, was different than the Palinka hire uh, and the Leon Rose maybe uh, situation. But um, I like this move for the Bulls. Maybe we'll see how it pans out. But like, I would be encouraged if I was a, a Bulls fan. But it's also, as you said, it's confirmation bias where they found Jokic. And when you, you find that kind of talent where they did, someone ends up getting the benefit of that from an executive standpoint. Like, this guy might be a good drafter or not. We don't know, but he's got that, he's got that check mark. Yeah. The man who found Jokic in the second round. The man who found Giannis, you know, in the middle of the first. The guy who acquired Chris Middleton for nothing. And, you know, you can look at it, their draft record and say, you know, Michael Porter looks like a player. They, you know, they, they got him by being patient. Monty Morris, you know, contributor, second rounder. Yeah. But then Malik Beasley, same deal. But you kind yeah. of also look at them and you're like, well, Jamal Murray's pretty good. You know, Hernan Gomez didn't pan out. Moutier didn't pan out. No. You know, like yeah. they, they missed on some pretty good picks too. So many. And yeah, when you, when, you relitigate someone's track record like that, everyone kind of like hits 300 or, you know, shoots 40%. Um, and there are certain outliers like Jokic that really, and Giannis that capture our imagination. And there's a part of the NBA that I'm really curious about, like the insider part about how people perceive these actions and how they frame them. Like if, if everyone had like a running log of what people were thinking, like if every GM kept a diary or something or explained to their owners like why they made moves, where they were feeling the, the uh, team was going, and if we had all that data in real time, like we could identify uh, good GMs versus bad GMs. But we, I think as fans, are left with this nebulous kind of guessing game about what these owners are thinking when they hire them. Personally speaking, I don't care about drafting. If, if you, no, you don't. If, if you miss every pick, like, and you're bad at drafting, then you probably shouldn't be in charge of doing that for an NBA team. If you're just, like, incredibly bad at it. Yeah. But generally speaking, I'm, I'm with you. There's going to be hits. There's going to be misses. It's more like how do you acquire more draft picks to get more chances? Yes, exactly. How, you know, how do you say... I don't know, avoid selling second rounders on an annual basis. Like, you know, just things like that. How do you stash players overseas that could end up becoming ballers or commodities later in time? Like, how do you do those things? Because if we go back to June 22nd, 2017, and we look at the 13th pick in the draft, that was Donovan Mitchell. He was drafted by the Nuggets and immediately traded for Tyler Lydon and Trey Lyles. That was a disastrous move. That was a terrible, terrible trade. Utterly, utterly horrible. But we also kind of don't hold that against a GM. And I'm not saying we should. But if mm-hmm. it's like the guy who found Jokic, like what about the guy who gave away Donovan Mitchell for nothing? Right. Like that, that, that's not good. And, and as, just to reiterate, I don't think we should be dis- determining who's good or bad by finding a gem in the second round or blowing a lottery pick. But they both exist. It's the yeah. same front office. So what? They're great at finding Euros in the second, but terrible at identifying, <laughs> you know, all cops, stars. Yeah. cop yeah. all stars and, and you know, officers. They, they identifying drafted, undercovers. They yeah. drafted and traded Gobert too. They they built the Utah Jazz. <laughs> Man, Gobert and Donovan Mitchell walked into the Nuggets room in champion sweatshirts, backwards Yankees caps, a bulge <laughs> at the chest, and Timberlands, and they're like, you guys aren't undercover at all. Like, you guys you guys are not going to ask for my ID at any point tonight. Derek Jeter. Um, <laughs> respect. Um, but, yeah, it's a, we do that outside of the draft all the time as NBA fans, right? Like, 
Michael Jordan is undefeated in the finals. I'm like, what about all those seasons he didn't even make it to the finals? Like, oh, forget about those. He's perfect. I'm like, except when he doesn't get there or when Kobe Bryant hits game winners. Like, what about the air balls? Like, just the winners, baby. And I'm like, this is what we do, right? Jokic, he's the guy who drafted Giannis Antetokounmpo when no one else knew who he was. I'm like, it's sort of like, who knew <laughs> Luka Doncic was going to be this star? I'm like, well, everybody except three GMs, which was wild. Jokic, no, excuse me, sorry, sorry. Gobert was traded by the Nuggets to the Jazz for Eric Green, who was a second rounder, and cash. Not a good move. Just a terrible trade. <laughs> Just awful. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. The, the point all remains the same. I'm, yeah. Yeah, this is arbitrary, right? And like, that's why immediately I'm like, oh, does, is Karnasovas like really beloved in Europe? And like, I'm sure he is. And does does he have some sort of powers outside of what we've seen <laughs> him do? Because that would only be the only reason why he gets fired or an upgrade like that within the corporation of the NBA. And it's like all these guys are kind of interchangeable at a certain point, right? He might be a great GM. I have no idea. I just, I really don't know his worldview. Yeah, and we might not be able to tell his worldview in five years either. It's like, yeah, he hit on that, but he traded Gobert too. Less Gobert's, you know, like, I don't, we don't know how to do this because all we have is like a small sample size of success and failure. But maybe we're framing this wrong anyway. Maybe that's the shorthand for mm. Karnasovas. He's the Jokic guy. He, he, he pinpointed Jokic and Nurkic. He's the Euro whisperer. But, <laughs> but, but maybe that's not what the Bulls are hiring him for. The Bulls are not sure. like, oh, well, it's this and that. They're like, well, can you bring a semblance of what the Nuggets have done being in that organization, working with, you know, the being kind of second in command there, being integral in watching this team uh, of younger guys. They were an extremely young team uh, turn into a contender over the course of two or three years. Can you bring that kind of uh, organic internal success to our organization? And if so, like, here's our talent. Look, we have a bunch of young guys. Can you can you do something with this? And I mean, he, he seems like a good hire. I think that's the best way of hiring guys is looking at organizations who you admire and want to emulate and hiring someone who is intimately familiar with the way that occurred. I mean, I've been rewatching True Detective, so, but this is like a GM's career is a flat circle, right? Because that immediately goes back to, well, what they did in Denver is they got Nikola Jokic. Mm -hmm. And it comes back to that flat view, right? Of like, well, we can't talk about Jokic in particular because he created a culture of winning. And I'm like, oh no, it's just the player. He got Nikola Jokic, therefore they are winning. It's true. It's hard, yeah. I mean, I'm just spitballing. It's hard to figure this out. Absolutely. And that's why it would require the Bulls looking more into the, the minutia. Mm. Like uh, we want to do these kind of things with finding Monte Morris's. We want to. We want more eye. <laughs> we always want more, more, <laughs> more eye. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because this kind of bleeds into the trend of hiring the Leon Roses and Palinkas, who don't necessarily have front office basketball experience, but have been around front offices on the other end of it, and they provide a different skill which may align more than we think to like a successful GM skill, which is communication, making deals, all that stuff. Absolutely. And, and there seem to be more than, you know, one way to like skin a cat here. Hey. You can have a Maury type of GM mm. or you can have an Ainge type who puts people like Zarin beneath him and uses them to inform his decisions. Like, you know, mm. like, there are certain components you have to have. You have to have an appreciation for analytics, but you know, we don't necessarily know like what mindset makes a good GM other than being like thoughtful and smart and making good decisions. It's decision-making. It's not like an outlook. It's not like a worldview or one type of individual, right? Like yeah. we're, we're literally talking about an aggregate of decisions. Did you make a bunch of good decisions out of a hundred decisions. 
Yeah. And who if so, you you're probably a good GM. Yeah, like who do you trust in your office? Like Karnasovas climbed the ladder in Denver. He was the hire. And I would be most interested in like, well, if if I appoint you as to my GM position, who would be your scouts? Who would be the assistant GM? I just want to know all these things because they're as important as you are. Right, so there's no inherent problem with having Leon Rose as your GM, no, no, but he good. has to have other people around him who are cap wizards and analytics dudes. And if you get the right people to feed the right information up the pipeline, and you have the right scouts, and you have the right worldview organizationally, then it doesn't really matter if it's you know Rob Polinka or it's I don't know like you know a Rosas a, a Mori disciple mm -hmm. it's it's all about the information going to a place where the decision gets made properly 100 you know, like I, yeah you you hire Leon Rose and it's like okay you can't hire your office because it's going to be Alan Houston and Steve Mills and you're like oh this is just like tomato tomato <laughs> exactly because your decisions are going to be compromised the thing about, you know, when we're bringing up like analytics and, and biometrics and all the kind of team building is that I remember talking with a, a baseball stat nerd like a decade ago or something. And this was first when we were seeing, you know, whether it was like true shooting percentage or win shares. It was just the very beginning of, of basketball analytics. VORP. VORP. But there was no spatial information at that point. Right, right. Um, there was on off court stuff is really useful now. Yeah, you had some of that, but the box score version, you know, there, 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 there right. just weren't, there just wasn't the kind of availability. There wasn't synergy play types. We just didn't have that shit, or at least mm -hmm. I didn't. And I remember him saying, like, here's the spoiler alert what's happened in baseball is going to happen in basketball. And there'll be fewer and fewer and fewer dumb organizations. And that's just how it's going to happen. And people will argue and there'll be the analytics skeptics, the Barclays and whoever, the Larry Browns, and those guys will eventually be on the wrong side of history and they'll get, and they'll get you know, um, like plucked out and everyone will be generally pretty smart. And that's just what's going to happen in basketball. And we're seeing that. We're not, there are very few straight up dumb teams anymore. There's a couple, but there aren't many. Yeah. You know, like everyone's more, there are guys who are outliers who are, the, you know, Toronto and, and Boston and the Rockets that are really at the vanguard of, of being Even progressive. Even Golden State. Golden State, yeah, but right, there, you know, I think at this point, though, there aren't that many teams that I would call stupid. And Chicago, at this point, is probably moving out of that category or out of, you know, the back end in terms of decision makers to probably closer to that center mass. Right. I mean, even with, even without knowing anything about this dude, I'm like, he's probably better than the guys they had running up for the last 18 years. Like most likely he's not going to come in there and do lunatic shit. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, this has eerily um, like compare. You can compare this the way like a virus or the heat map of the U.S. and this this Roni, you know, like eventually this will touch kind of every corner, but it's going to take time and it starts in places like New York or hot spots like California and the hubris would be like, nah, this is never going to get to us, but like, right. Analytics is everywhere at this point. And the people who haven't accepted it, like the Knicks are just going to have to suffer through it and then realize that everyone has adapted already. The only people who don't adapt are the ones who don't have a pressing need to. And that's these family businesses like the Knicks and the Lakers. They're the Making only so teams. Much money. They're so the much only money. teams that like they're the big markets. They can always draw stars, or at least in their minds they can. <laughs> always yeah. gonna be always gonna be on the media radar, always gonna be talked about, always gonna have money. And like they're the kind of the two holdouts in terms of franchises that just refuse to sort of get with the program and even their decisions of Polinka and Leon Rose are different. Now, of course it just matters who they put underneath them, but those are very different ways of approaching a franchise than like, I don't know, like that, like Orlando is doing Orlando's like, all right, we're going to get a guy from Milwaukee. They're not like, let's hire a super agent. 
Right, right. I mean, I have hope with the super agent thing, but a, a glimmer. It's I mean, not it, big it, hope. It, it worked in L.A. because LeBron wanted to play there. It's all, Yeah, and you know, I think this week Palenka was like, we passed the test and we only have to take the finals and it's going to be a shame if we can't take that test because mission accomplished. And I'm like, you messed up, dude. Like, <laughs> in spite of you, the Lakers were so good because LeBron ascended even higher into heaven you know Le- like Le- lebron went there and then had his people coerce anthony davis to request a trade to come and play with him <laughs> like, and then you you gave up all the useful pieces in order to make that happen and you kept the wrong guy like we, so we did it <laughs> like, yeah yeah I'm it's like, like kuzma we're holding on to kuzma i'm like are you sure no you're just you're just riding lebron's coattails like mo williams <laughs> Shout out to Mo Williams, who was a good player. But um, yeah, the six, it's like, was he the, the fifth or sixth member of Bone Thugs? <laughs> the seventh member of Bone Mo, Thugs. Mo Thugs, Mo Williams. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, right. Like we frame the Lakers as success, but all I see is LeBron and AD. I'm like, those guys, man, They it is successful that LeBron wanted to play there and yo know, if you're Rob Palenka you got to say this stuff right like you're not going to be like I didn't do anything this is all LeBron you got to be like I was hey, in the room man look he is entitled to say that yeah like at the end of the day we're talking about results mm-hmm. and in this grand scheme of things mm-hmm. Rob Palenka can say I was in charge with my guy magic when we put together a team that had the best record in the west and we had two of the top five players in the league on our squad. I did that. I built that. And you can't say he didn't. I mean, we know how it worked out. Yeah. But someone was sitting in that director's chair, and it happened yeah. to be Rob. Yeah. And it feels like spin, but it, I don't think it quite is when we say, like, this is just on LeBron. This is because of LeBron. Because if LeGroin makes an appearance, then... <laughs> This whole season looks different for them. He has no parachute. He jumped out of the plane being like, I'll land somewhere eventually. And he did. When it's all said and done, LeBron's influence over the last 15 years in the NBA is just astounding. As it should be. Because he has been the best player in history. So you would expect him to have an impact. And everything really is in the relief of LeBron. It's like... The Lakers are a contender again because LeBron felt like going there. And even stuff we've talked about in the past, like the sort of elevation of both Dirk and Tim Duncan as beloved figures in comparison to LeBron and the evil heat, you know, Kyrie being a champion. Everything is is so based on the sphere of influence around LeBron. Rich Paul becoming an incredibly powerful agent and getting contracts for his players that paid them before like coronavirus hit. Like this is it's all just this LeBron like I don't know, fallout. And it's kind of incredible because I I would say it happened with Jordan as well, but like I just wasn't as attuned to basketball in the way that we are now. I mean, I was thinking about this a lot. I've been thinking about this a lot this last month because we always we have to put ourselves in a position where what eventually hopefully when we come out of this corona thing life will look different and i i got myself into thinking about what things have happened in in history that have changed the way we think about fucking life right and that would be world wars um pandemics um assassinations uh, the civil rights movement. It changed the fabric of the way we think about this very uh, established thing. A religion, how does astrology respond to this pandemic? And then, of course, since this is a basketball pod, the most influential basketball pod, mm-hmm. I thought about the situations in the NBA where it was kind of turned upside down on us and we didn't see the same thing anymore. And this suspension of because of the pandemic would be one. Magic Johnson um, coming out with HIV positive was one. Um, And LeBron James entering this league has had such a seismic impact that nothing was the same ever. 
I agree. I will say, I think this is a topic I want to talk more fully about and I want to think about it mm. before we do. Because LeBron is on my mind mm -hmm. and I think you are right. But I want to think about other, other elements. And I feel like that's a great Friday show. Ooh, Friday's going to be amazing. Thank God it'll be Friday. I'm going to find some joggers and make some citizens arrests. And then we're going to talk about seismic. It was never the same again moments in the NBA tomorrow. And I will go through my equipment and make sure none of it is Italian or British or French made and try to get a better listening experience for our And I am going to order a pizza to your house and watch you squirm. That aroma, I'll be like, oh, that so aroma. delicious, so comforting. Compromise you. No pizza. Meatballs too spicy. Cookies! Cookies! Thank you.